She is a scroll saw expert, and she works in Woodcraft. She's retired. She's retired, but she works in Woodcraft, at least part-time. She loves making sawdust. She used to, in a former life, do some computer programming. So uh, Help her, Lord. <laughs> sort of an sort of interesting yeah, background, but now she loves making sawdust, and uh, she wasn't trying to remain aloof tonight, but she does have some health problems that cause her to pass out if she gets too hot, so she was trying to stay at the door. So if she passes out, I need a couple else. of you to help me get her outside, okay? But other than that, she'll be okay. It'll frighten you more than it frightens me. It's a cold child. I have cataplexy. I don't know if you guys have heard of narcolepsy. People fall asleep, right? Well, cataplexy is uh, a t light narcolepsy. In fact, a lot of people who have narcolepsy have it. But I will look asleep, but I won't be asleep. It's an in-between state. And But you'll think I've had a stroke. This is the problem. You think I've had a stroke, and I haven't had a stroke. I just need to get cool. <laughs> and that's why I don't develop software anymore. Okay. So, you heard the good bits. I like to make sawdust. I don't make them as much as I want to make because I'm working on my house now, which is, uh, so I reduced my hours at Woodcraft some, but I'm back there three days a week now. Uh, I'm a tool addict. Paul was nice enough to share with me his, his at least love of collecting tools, so I really like tools. But I, um, I really got involved in woodworking. Um, well, I started with my father-in-law 25 years ago. He had a shop, so when I go to visit, you know, I put the hat on and run down to the shop and just sand and do whatever he was doing, and I liked doing it. So my dad gave me his radial arm saw. I had a circular saw. I didn't do much, but because I, I owned my own business, and uh, but I piddled a little bit. And had I been scrolling in those years that I was a software developer having my own business. I had never gotten sick, I don't believe. So I tell everybody, if you've got kids or grandkids, make sure that they're, they're, they're living a balanced life. That was one of the things that I didn't do. So um, <coughs> let me tell you a little bit about the scroll saw. The scroll saw, I've heard people say before, well, it's kind of like a sewing machine. Well, it goes up and down. But I'm telling you, a sewing machine is a lot more complicated tool than a scroll saw. <laughs> I got a lot of respect for people who sew. <laughs> Um, and I will tell you that if you are a sewer, there are habits that you have in sewing, expectations of what that machine does that will work against you with a scroll saw. The biggest of which is with a sewing machine, it pulls the fabric through and we're just keeping up with the machine. With the scroll saw, I can run this thing all day long. But if I stop pushing, it stops cutting. And that's a really, that's an important thing to know. And that's often the biggest thing that uh, people have to overcome. Forgive me here, my DeWalt. Do I tell you that I tried to, I tried to load this thing. I have a walkout basement that does not have a drive, driveway going to it. And I was getting a neighbor to help me load the saw. And I said, oh, I've got brains. I don't have much brawn. I can fold these legs up and get it on my cart. Well, I dropped my scroll saw. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is my portable, which tells me I will not take my Excalibur on the road. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so I've used a lot of scroll saws. My very first one was a rigid scroll saw. Went off to Home Depot. What was I doing? My daughter was seven years old. She had a project. She had to build a house that either a pilgrim or a Native American lived in at the first Thanksgiving. We lived in Massachusetts at the time. My daughter had been to Plymouth. So what are we going to do? Post and bean salt box. And yes, I am Virgo. My daughter is a Sagittarius. And uh, so I said, well, baby, I know you're only seven years old, but let me tell you, we're going to start with the plans. You're going to lay the plans out. I'm going to tell you how this whole post and bean thing works. And you're going to build it one wall at a time. And we're using hot glue. That was the only thing. Hot glue and that basswood. And she's got a little hand saw. Well, I was going broke supplying her with basswood because this is a big model. We got to the siding, and I said, we've got to go somewhere and get something cheap. What could we get cheap but little uh, molding, pine molding at Home Depot? Bring it back home. Got my little seven-year-old, her little saw. I thought, oh, my gosh, we are going to be here a month while this kid cuts all this stuff. I run back, and I buy a jigsaw. Brought that home. 
god-awfulest tool I had ever used in my life. <laughs> Waste of money. Why were people selling these things? I go back, and I had seen the scroll saw thing uh, because I had been uh, seen an RBI at a fair, you know, because I was kind of interested in this. Well, it gave me my excuse. The guy sends me off with a $250 scroll saw and a pack of spiral <coughs> blades. Oh, <geez. laughs> he said, just put your stuff in there and push it around and it'll cut. Wherever you push it, it'll cut. Well, uh, uh, uh. I, this guy, I mean, I didn't like him, he was just telling me that. So I go home, I put the blades in, and I pushed it around and it cut. But if I didn't push, if I hiccuped, it cut. And it cut horribly. It left this horrible cut. So I spent the next year, Virgo that I am, going to figure out how this thing works. Oh, by the way, my daughter finished her uh, uh, post and being salt box. It's awesome. Uh, and she went on, she's a woodworker of her own right now. That was her first major project. But she did an Italian, Italianate villa from the Renaissance with all clay tiles in her freshman year of high school. And her dad and I helped fix in each individual tile. That was awful. But she's done some wonderful things while I'm off making sawdust, right? Just, just having fun with things. So I started out, first of all, doing little things like this. I like frog and toad. Do you guys know frog and toad? I used to buy little wooden crafts at Walmart and ceramic and set up my paints, you know, do my little art thing. The scroll saw was perfect for that because now I didn't have to buy those things and I could do things that I wanted to. So this was my very first project. And yes, if you inspect it closely, it's got busted out eyes. I haven't ever checked these to see if they were scrolled at 90 degrees, but it goes together okay. I mean, it works all right. Um, and I hand painted that, and uh, I've kept it around. And this was that molding that we used on the, my daughter's house that we got, we got at Home Depot. So all this was Home Depot, Home Depot wood. And then before I know it, it's Christmas time, and why do we have these scroll saws? Husbands, did you get your wife a scroll saw so that she could keep busy without your hair? That's right. Well, ladies, y'all can make money with the scroll saw if you want to. Not a lot of money, but, you know, a little bit of money. Hopefully enough money to pay for tools. Um, <laughs> that's all I'm trying to do is break even. Um, so what I started doing, though, was the first thing I did is I started making gifts, you know, all the time, Christmas gifts. And then everybody got used to getting Christmas gifts of handmade Christmas ornaments. First, first year, everybody got a set of six. I changed that the second year. We made 24 of just one ornament. This has got to be like a Hallmark thing. It's got to be slow this sucker down. It doesn't take very long before you're coming from uh, a hand-painted piece. Just take a piece of wood and turn it up here, and we're going to put a pattern on it. And I'll, and I'll show you. I'm working on a copepelli over here. Uh, and we'll cut it. And, and uh, it doesn't take very long before you can actually do this. And this looks very complicated, right? This is called segmentation. All I did was take three colors of wood and stack them on top of each other. I cut the horse out, took those three, that mix of woods, right? And because I cut them out, even if I didn't follow the line, this set of three horses went together just fine. And the only thing that I learned from that experience, or the big thing that I learned from that experience of doing segmented Christmas ornaments, because I still think that they are <coughs> some of the most beautiful <coughs> ornaments, and they're very, very easy to do. I wanted to show you this. You start with a stack of three colors of wood, right? Put your pattern on it. The trick comes in is how do you get the stuff to glue up here because it's really rather complicated. So I took a scrap piece of plywood, put another pattern down, nailed some little nails in here, and I, in the beginning I used CA glue, super glue, right? Uh, two things, two problems with that. One, I kept gluing my fingers together. And there's only so many layers of skin you can cut through before you hit blood. So get that solvent. We sell that at Woodcraft. That's a good thing to have. And the next, the, the biggest thing was is when you're going to, when you're doing these as Christmas ornaments, they, you drop them right, and that CA glue is brittle. It will, it doesn't take much to have it uh, break. So then I started using epoxy, five-minute epoxy, and epoxy is very strong and it's kind of rubbery too, so it's got a little bit of give to it. 
It will make a mess, though, on both sides. You'll have this epoxy ooze out. And then all, all I had to do was sand it on a sander. Uh, you need something a little beefier than this, like a little small belt sander. Sand that off, and then I put my finish on it here. So segmentation is a really easy thing to do. Remember I said I make 24 of whatever I'm making? So when I'm doing these horses, right, I got eight sets of three. Only the three horses that are cut together at the same time fit together. So I'm being very productive, right? So you just got to remember to have a little bowl. Those three little horses stay together. The next three stay together and so forth. And then you can glue everything up. One of my goals with the scroll saw has been to learn every technique that there is that you can do on a scroll saw. And I've taken the scroll saw, I think, to limits I don't think that it was supposed to have been taken to. Because I didn't own a band saw. And I knew a band saw was kind of a big scroll saw. It kind of went up and down and it made those cuts. And, you know, the only difference was with a scroll saw, I can do internal cuts. This is called fretwork. And so somebody said to me one day, said, Deborah, do you, don't tell me you really like that fretwork. And what they're thinking of is Victorian fretwork. Well, my in-laws have beautiful Victorian gingerbread. And yes, I've done uh, Victorian uh, restorations for Victorian houses. Somebody gives me a broken um, corner bracket, and I'll be able to make a pattern from that and create these other ones for them. And I'm thinking, but there's beautiful fretwork. I'm not sure I put the Victorian pieces in my house, but there's beautiful fretwork, oriental fretwork. Uh, you know, when you go to the Chinese restaurant, that's, a, that's fretwork. Anything that's got an internal cut is fretwork. My daughter did this. This also is fretwork. It's just got a back to it. And yeah, I was a good mama that day because I let her make this mistake, right? So she cuts the bird out, out of the one layer of plywood. Got it all nice. She says, Mama, I, I think I want to make a coaster out of this. And um, I think I want it to have a back. Okay, all right. So she puts the back back on here and uh, tries to now cut the back to the same shape as the top layer. Well, that's very difficult. What I, what I, but I let her go through that process so that she knows that those two pieces are not going to fit very well together, right? She remembers that lesson. She doesn't remember it if I tell her in advance. What I often do when I have anything with interior cuts and a back, like this. My pattern is on the exterior piece. You make all your interior cuts first. Before I um, am ready to do, when I'm ready to do the back, I simply uh, then, in this case the back is painted a little bit before I do the glue up. I do the glue up, then I cut it all out as one piece. And that's really handy because I do a lot of signage as well. And so that comes in really handy. So you have to think about the process a little bit. So there's, there's fret work. There is segmentation, which everybody thinks is complicated, but this isn't very complicated at all. And there is something that we call cutting in relief. The gentleman here with the inlay. The in, inlay table, is that you, sir? Did you use hand tools to do that inlay? Because that looked like federal inlay. It's absolutely beautiful. I'm actually doing a class next month on inlay. We're going to demonstrate a little more brutally how you can do it with a router. But then how also you can do it with a scroll saw. That's inlay right there. You can't see this because I didn't own any ebony at the time, but that is, can you, can you see it? Where's our, where's our camera here? Y'all forgive me if I get used to this. I'm not Martha Stewart. So this is um, actually yellow heart that's been inlaid into wood. It's the uh, Star, Trek, Star Trek emblem. And it's flat now, and it's like regular old inlay, but we do this with a scroll saw. So we're going to do a class on that um, next, uh, next month because when you do inlay with a scroll saw, you can come up with various different things. This is inlay. Same as this. The only difference was is I sanded that flat after, I, after it had protruded forward, right? This is cut from one piece of wood plus a back. And here's how, here's how it works. I start out with 3 quarter inch Baltic birch. I'm cutting on a bevel. So the first trick is to drill the hole at an angle, an approximate angle, and find a place to put the hole where it's not going to be visible because you will see that hole in the end. Um, after it's cut, 
it's like a puzzle that doesn't fit together well. You guys, surely those of you who have scrolled have done that, right? By accident, one of, your, one of your puzzles you're going along, you cut it, it goes together one way, but it doesn't go together the other way. And that's because it is cut at a bevel. And I don't know if you guys can see this. I'll pass this around. The very first thing that you do is you take your blade and your material, and you set your saw table at a degree setting. This ranges from one degree up to seven degrees. So you can tell at one when I cut at the table when the, when the blade is tilted at one degree, if it's three quarters of an inch, it will barely catch. When it's seven degrees, I can only put it a little ways forward. But pass that around, because this is a kind of an interesting piece. So I keep this around. Now, I had to record on there what size blade I was using, because my blade is going to take a curve out of it. But I like to keep this around because all I did was push it through and then put some hot glue in the back. And now, if I were doing this for sale, right, I would do it again. Push it through, put some hot glue here, and then finally glue the, the back on. And it kind of looks complicated, but it's not very complicated. It's just a technique. Um, this is the sweetest. I love to make for a lot of reasons. They appealed to my Virgo of exactness. Did I tell you I was a Swiss watchmaker in a past life? I'm absolutely convinced of that. I don't think I made many sales, but <laughs> I think I was under that detail business. This is something else I'll pass around. Some of this stuff, be just gentle with it, because I had found some of my things. I chipped them in trying to hurry up and put them in my drawers, right? This is bevel cut. It's made out of one piece of wood. But if you make a bevel, and scroll turning clockwise, your bevel will either, your piece will either wedge forward, but if you go in the opposite direction, it wedges backwards. So when I had these, and these, this, I forget the, I want to say it's the berry basket these patterns were from. Um, it took me many tries with this one ornament till I had it, the stocking protruded forward, the, 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 Inset of the fireplace protruded back, and I had all of my degrees recorded. This is going to be at three degrees, this is going to be at five degrees, and so on and so forth. Another tip that I do, I keep my patterns, and I record on there what size blade I use, what materials I use, and what degree settings, all of my little notes here. And often what mistakes I made the first time around so I can make new mistakes the second time I do that. <laughs> So, there's um, bevel work. We can also cut veneers. This was just a little, a lot of these things I've done just to show a technique, but these are veneers that I have put onto these ornaments here. And basically when you're cutting something very, very thin, including things like paper, foam, leather, fabric, some of these things I'm not sure why you would cut them, but I have done the, the little paper pads, that's really kind of cool. Just sandwich your materials between two pieces of plywood and now you're actually cutting wood and you know the texture of wood and now you can gauge what size saw blade for, for you to select for your project. Um, other things that you can do, here's metal, plastic, um, Baltic birch. You'll see me do a lot in Baltic birch and I tell people when you're first starting out, start out with Baltic birch. Plywood doesn't have a brain. When you're first choosing patterns, you may be choosing them just because you like that pattern. And you hadn't calculated if you cut that horse with a spindly little leg going in one direction, the little spindly little leg is going to break off. But if you cut it with the grain going in the opposite direction or on a diagonal, it won't. So start out with Baltic birch. And then I say go to poplar. Poplar is one of those gracious woods. You don't have to worry about things like grain catching your blade like you do when you're cutting red oak. Um, you don't have to worry about splintering that we get when you get with cypress. So start out with a poplar and then go from there. Now, another technique that is really quite cool, and I have one of these in oak. This was my prototype that I did um, when Woodcraft first came to Nashville. I threw my application in, what the heck, I was just making sawdust. I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything you know, useful anymore, like developing software. So I threw my application in, and, and, I, and, and he hired me. I'm not sure why he did, but he hired me. Um, 
And then I saw these lathes, and I'd never seen these lathes before, and, and my husband, who grew up woodworking, I can't talk him into coming into the shop, you know, to help, unless it's just something I, it's complicated and I need to go over with him. I'll get him to take a turning class. Sure enough, he loves it. We buy the lathe. I'm trying to do it. My daughter's trying to do it. But I'm a Virgo. <laughs> and Virgos like to have a pattern. We like to know what the plan is, execute the plan, and we're going to come out real close to the plan. You turners, that's called emergent art. You're over here turning and it goes bang, and then some blowout happens on this. Well, I would like to scrap it and start over, and I've got a nice piece of firewood. My friend Larry, who used to work at Woodcraft, no, we'll just turn that, we'll use that burst there, and we'll let it something else evolve from this piece of wood. Well, I got a little jealous of all those guys turning. Somebody brought a candlestick in. I said, well, I can do a candlestick on a scroll saw. So I did. I did a candlestick. Pass that around. This is called three, this is called 3D or compound cutting. And it's really, again, very easy to do once you know what you're doing. When you do compound cutting, your pattern goes onto two sides of the wood. So you're gluing it down here. Now, in this case, I developed. This is my, my own pattern here. And that's one of the things I've been trying to do, right? All this time, I'm teaching classes, I'm using other people's work, and I'm going, but I have to change that because it doesn't demonstrate this technique that I need to demonstrate. So then I start developing my own things. So you cut it one way, and now you've got three pieces. <coughs> You put it back together. I think cabriolet legs are done in this fashion for furniture makers. You turn it over, and now you cut it a second way, and now you've got a three-dimensional tied object here. Carvers use this technique. They don't call it anything fancy. They're just roughing out on the bandsaw, right? But that's, they're doing, it in essence, the same thing, getting a rough out. If I were to take my Dremel and smooth the corners of, those, of this uh, candlestick, it would become round instead of... Uh, angular that it is now. Now, oh. anybody get uh, Meisel, Measel, Meisel, how do you guys pronounce it? The little catalog, they sell tchotchkes, plans for like yard art. You take a big piece of plywood and use that skill saw that does that awful thing and you make yard art for Halloween and stuff. Well, Paul Meisel had great ideas. I just love this. He started doing these things that were compounded. He could make like this lion. I could, instead of yard art of this, you know, hillbilly behind staring at me in the face in, from the flower garden, I could do like this three-dimensional regal lion at my uh, driveway, you know? And I thought that was really quite clever. So my daughter, who inspires me for a lot of things, and we like Halloween. So, um, there's actually this original plan starts with a gargoyle, which I haven't executed yet, but I intend to. Has a gargoyle sitting up here. So I developed a class out of this. This is made on the scroll saw. And there's actually made with four pieces of wood. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, in class, we even cut this this piece here on a bevel. I supply the bases here, but everything else is done right in class. And we put a little uh, a little recess in here for a candle. And so I sprayed it with stone. And now it looks, you know, it's supposed to hang. You know, you do a series of these, and you put your little candle on, and you got your little your little black <laughs> chain, you know. And it's a Martha Stewart thing. Over here. <laughs> okay, so nothing impressive yet, right? This is all Chotsky work, except that some of the finest things I've ever seen in furniture making have been done with scroll saw. Once at uh, Taka, a guy had done complete inlay of his doors. They were uh, like vines and so forth that you could only do with a scroll saw because they were, it was visible on both sides of the door. It was not done just as a marquetry inlay. And after about a year, I think I was scrolling for a year, and that was a lot. You know, I was doing a, I was doing a lot of scrolling and a lot of cursing because I kept breaking that blade and I couldn't figure this thing out. I don't understand why I keep, but it's all right, I got a lot of blades. I'll just keep going. But I saw 
Robert's studio, Judy Gale Roberts, down at uh, Sevierville, and she does intarsia. And I had actually seen her at um, uh, seen her some of her work at a show because there was a scroll saw picnic for a couple of years here, actually in Middle Tennessee. And she had done this tiger, a tiger in motion. Judy Gale is an artist who kind of her father was an artist, and she's an artist, and she worked with him and. This man would just do anything. So he'd get these orders for these murals in these office buildings, and they had a bandsaw, and they'd cut the stuff out of wood and glue it up on the wall, and boom, they've got art. Well, when Jerry Boer, her, who, who she married and has just recently divorced, but he was instrumental in helping her develop this form of intarsia, uh, helped her with the technical de details of how to do intarsia. What is intarsia? Intarsia is wood mosaic. It is the precursor to marquetry. Market, it goes, intarsia dates back to 1400s. And there is um, a ducal palace, that's a, a duke's palace, a ducal palace that has, you, know, you guys know what Trump Leal Trump, Trump is? When it's a faux, this is normally done as paint, right? They'll do, a, do something on a wall and it'll make it look as if it's really there. This was done in wood pieces, wooden pieces. It's all flat work. But what makes it an intarsia was the word that was given for it. The pieces would have been thick at that time. And it's an entire room. So you go into this room and it is a library where monks are studying in this room. It's, just, it's one of those things that, for a woodworker, in my opinion, Natsuki, you go see when you go to Japan, if you're in Italy, you gotta go see this Ducal Palace, and I think fine woodworking has a, a location for that. I'm sorry, I don't know where that was. So, Judy Gale developed intarsia that gives vast relief to it, right? I'm using terms all you guys know, right? I mean, we just make sawdust when we use scroll saw, but we can make art. So I had actually attempted, I did my first couple of intarsia pieces, I used Judy Gale's book, Small Intarsia. Boy, did I make a mistake. Small Intarsia, little, little is easier. Yeah? Yes. Easier than me. No. These earrings, I made these earrings. Don't make earrings. Oh, there's a lady who does a presentation on some absolutely beautiful earrings, and God love her for doing it. I probably have to make some more, but it's really quite difficult. So I did her, a couple of her small tarja and in, tarja in tarja projects, and decided I wanted to take a class. I wound up taking a beginner, an intermediate, and two advanced classes within about two years, three years. But in that first class. That very first class, because I'm going, well, I don't think I need to take that beginner in charge of class. I mean, you know, it looks like a bird. It looks like an acorn. I won't tell you how many acorns I had to actually sand before I could find them and just kept throwing them, and didn't throw them out throughout the shop. But my husband, who also we, we taught computers, he says, Deborah, you know that you need to go to that beginner class, even if it's really easy for you, because you're going to learn something very fundamental that you didn't know. And absolutely, I learned several things that very first time. The most important of which is there's a note to, to actually tighten your blade to. Now, I don't know what the note is. I know when it's right, but I don't know what the note is. I don't know if it's an A, a B, or a C. But regardless of what blade I put in here, you just tighten your... That's pretty good right there, right? What is it, Richard? What? Ping, 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 ping. <laughs> <laughs> That's a post. Ping, 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 ping. ping. At, one time, <laughs> at one time, Jerry Boer, who was a retired uh, tool and die man, so if you thought I was anal, this man was even more so, right? He actually put this note on the web, on the internet, so that you would know it is. And I don't know that it has to be exactly the note, but it's somewhere in that range. And I almost, and it doesn't vary whether it's a small blade or a large blade, it's usually that note. Um, so I learned that. I learned that there was an alternative to affixing your patterns. How do you guys put patterns down for anything that you're doing? 
Tape. Spray. Tape? Is that that spray stuff? That you got all over your table saw afterwards? I don't know, because you got that big piece of wood that you're going to put on your table saw before you do it. So you don't get any overspray? Well, you don't spray it on the day. You turn around and put a piece of paper down to spray it. Okay. All right. And, throw the paper away. and I still use that from time to time, especially on a big piece, because I learned for small pieces, restickable glue sticks. And so I keep, I keep, if I can find my stuff, just a clipboard with, um, Put board with some scrap paper on it, take my pattern, take my glue stick, and I want to rub it on really good, make sure I don't have any pieces that are missing. And in the case of a compound pattern, there's actually a fold that I have to <coughs> honor here as the corner. Oops, it's not just a piece of wood. Or does it? Yeah, it does. Does it? No, it doesn't. Some of my samples, I think I will do it anyway. When you rub it down, just burnish it with the back end. This was a godsend right here. Number one, it's little, right? And I can just stick it over here. Big thing is that I don't have any overspray anymore. I've also uh, helped as a student teacher out at Judy Gales because Catherine, Catherine's a bright girl. She's off at UTC becoming an environmental scientist with a focus in engineering, right? Bright girl. She didn't listen to her mom, though. So she went down in the shop, right? And I'm scrolling and scrolling. And Catherine, as she's growing up, it should be about 10, though, before. I mean, I introduced her at 7, but maybe I shouldn't have introduced her at 7. And she always had this little fort down there in the shop in my little corner. And she'd ask me why I was doing things and help me with things like Sandy. But by the time she was 10, she read something about uh, a kid, this 10-year-old, was doing her own projects with a scroll saw. Well, Mama, I can do that, do my own stuff. Now she had concentration and she would get through the amount of time that it would do for that. So, one thing I really love about the scroll saw is this, this event that you guys have with 4,000 kids, that's a gift to you. Because I've done fairs with Catherine and we've made little name tags that those kids that are 10, 12, 13 years old, little, just, just little, just, just their name out of a piece of poplar, a piece of plywood. And um, Catherine would lay them out, and I would cut them, and I would tell them, you know, it's going to take me a few minutes. It's going to take me 10, 15 minutes to get this done. You guys can go ahead on to the next event, you know. No, they're going to watch me do this the whole time. I hosted her art club at my house. Um, thank goodness there was at least one other adult there. Um, this was about eight kids building birdhouses, right, at my house. And so that, and this, the, one of her friends from that time period, this is something he still talks about. He's 19, 20 years old. So but I think it's a gift that you guys should relish that you can do this. And that's one thing that I really love about the scroll saw is that I can share it with children. I have a 19 year old a young man who's actually in my shop, took a private lesson from me. And he's, I'm letting him come to my shop because he doesn't have his own shop. <laughs> He's making wooden glasses, wooden glasses, and he takes his glasses off and he says, you see this little notch right here? I've got to create that little hole right there. I said, "That's well, that, you've got to rabbit that in. I said, my gosh. I said, well, luckily I have a little miniature router table. We'll be able to handle that. And he says, and you know that little, that little groove that's on the inside that holds the lens in? I'm going, I said, you know, we, we have to give us a pair that's like 150 years old. They had to have done this in a different way. These guys have CNC routers. Who's that? CNC router and calling himself a woodworker. <laughs> That's a printer. <laughs> However, there are some things that I would love to be able to make on a CNC router. Just make a bunch of them. Um, but this kid is trying to do some of this stuff, so he's really inspired, and he is a, a 
well, a tailor, I guess. He's, he's done a lot of sewing, so he's, he's really very talented with his hands. So this is something you guys should cherish. Uh, what I was going to tell you, though, about the intarsia was that I had done student talk with uh, Judy Gale, because I, I talked Catherine into taking an intarsia class, because I had noticed that her scroll saw skills were awesome. I said, girl, where'd you learn how to scroll like that? You haven't taken any classes from me. She said, I'll watch you, mama. So she was watching me that whole time. So we went to Judy Gale's class. I know how to do intarsia. I teach intarsia classes. But she's going to get to learn from a master. So that, that event, that opportunity you guys have to work with Robert's studio, y'all should think about that. Judy Gale is absolutely the best intarsia artist, at least in the United States, if not the world. Period. End of story. You go there, and what do you learn from this woman? So incidentally, you're going to learn how to stay on the line. Right? You're going to learn how to stay on the line or close to the line when you're cutting out. But what you're going to learn how to do is how to do things like make it look like a bird. Make it look like the dog's nose is coming forward out of his face. She's done this figure of Christ on a cross. And she had an expert class on that to which I was invited, but I wasn't able to attend that one. Uh, you can feel Christ's ribs. You know, there is absolutely stunning work. And if you get no other opportunity except to see her work in her studio, because she's starting to sell some of her stuff out of the studio, and see that tiger in motion, and to run your hand along that and feel his muscles, that is, that's a really special thing to do. So intarsia is that level of scroll sawing that I think is now bordering on art. We've also done crossover classes where we've done, uh, Steve is a carver. He removes wood with knives. I remove wood with sanders, right, when I'm doing intarsia, but it's the same thing. I've, we've done, uh, I do pyrography with my scrolling. So scrolling, pyrography, and carving all really go hand in hand. And I've incorporated carving in my uh, signage as well. Okay. But I want to give you guys a pitch on why you need to take scroll saw class. Because you need to know how to select the right blade for your project. That's two things you got to know. How tight do you make your blade? And how do you stay on the line? Yes, we do talk about that, and there are techniques that you can do for staying on the line. But how do you select your blade? These are just some samples. In the old days, they were pin-end blades like that, right? Caught like that. Well, there are only five or six blades of this type anymore. And this is something, you get this free right at Woodcraft. I, I put mine in plastic. This is a chart from Olson. It lists on here all of the blades that they sell and their recommendations for what materials to cut. If you have no other thing except this, this will get you along the, the way to selecting the right blade. But what I found out was if this was a pin-in blade, the teeth are every, you know, they're, they're regimented. They're every individual space. They found out that this kind of burns. You know that 3D compound that's going around with the candlestick? That's thick. That's cut out of an inch and a half thickness of oak, uh, uh, poplar. And the one that was oak was even harder than that. I was able to cut it. There was no sanding involved. And it didn't burn, but it started to burn on it. One of the things that I do when, after I put my pattern on is I wrap it in, um, I, I cover it in packing tape, clear packing tape. That melts as it cuts and helps to keep the blade cool. The other thing is, is they found out as you knock a tooth out, you create a gullet, right? Band sawyers, you guys understand this. You create a gullet. That gives the blade room to move the sawdust out. That helps the blade to run cooler. So they called this a skip tooth blade. Then they developed one where they reversed the teeth on the bottom side. I had a gentleman earlier said he has a lot of drift in his saw, saw blade. And without seeing the nature of the saw, I will tell you that I have experienced a lot of drift. Uh, and actually, dri normally drift is about three to five degrees left of the blade. Every once in a while, I'd have a student, their drift is this way. And it took me a while to figure this out. What's going on here? they had the blade oriented in the wrong direction. And if you're using a reverse tooth blade, it'll cut. It'll still cut, but most of the teeth are pointing in the wrong direction. So if your blade drifts to the right, try reversing the orientation of it. So when I was cutting that really thick one, 
I actually had to go to a double skip tooth blade. Let me show you what that looks like. This was a skip tooth. Oh, right here. This is a skip tooth. How can you guys see? There you go. We've got to get it on against a, a background. This is a double skip tooth blade here. In essence, we knock yet every third tooth out. Now I have a small gullet and a large gullet. This is like riding a Bronco, though. <laughs> this is hard to control. So I just tell people, this, you just gotta, you just gotta know what you're dealing with. So I used a number nine PGT, precision ground tooth blade. I settled on Virgo that I am. I've purchased a dozen of every blade out there, right? But there's only about nine blades that I use for 80% of my work. And they are all reverse tooth. Olson sells the ones that I really that I use the most, but I'm not going to tell you they're the best, although I I like them an awful lot. And I will tell you, whatever blade company you work with, you're going to get accustomed to their blades. These are the, the online blades too that I do with Intarsia, just because I like to I like to know that I'm doing it the way Judy Gale would do it, but I'll often find out what is the close Olson equivalent to it. Reverse tooth is sharp. Uh, yes, reverse tooth is sharp. They just punch those blades out. Then they developed something that they call precision ground tooth. So now they took those blades, same blades, and they polished them. Extremely sharp. But then they, they ultimately came out with one that's in the middle, mock, M-A-C-H. It is only available in three sizes, a three, a five. No, four sizes, a three, five, seven, and nine. Those mock blades, I find, are the ones that I use the most. Three, five, seven, and nine mock blades. Uh, but I will tell you, think of reverse as sharp, mock as sharper, and PGT as sharpest. So when I had something really tough to tackle, I use a PGT because it's the sharpest. I have to use a big number, a number nine, because it cuts thicker wood. The higher the number, the thicker the wood you can cut. Veneer, skinny, we go down low, two, zero, double lot, triple lot. Those little Victorian puzzles that have almost zero kerf, triple lot. Those are very, the smallest that you can get. So I used a number nine PGT double tooth blade. And when I did it out of oak, the grain is grabbing me, wanting me to go with the oak grain. And it was really a difficult thing to cut. But, again, choosing the, the blade for the right, the task at hand. There is, we talked about a spiral. That's kind of my rendition of what a spiral looks like. There's one more, you, well, a couple more you should know about. One is called a crown tooth. And my friend Judy really likes crown tooth blades. My gold doesn't show up very well on video. Crown tooth blades are like skip tooth blades, but they orient every other tooth in an opposite direction. So when it gets dull in one direction, she swaps it around and reverses it. And there is no wrong orientation to this. So a crown tooth blade, you can put in either orientation. I've used, I haven't used them as much, so, and they, they drag a little bit according to the, my feel for reverse tooth blades, but they're an excellent option. And it used to be that you only used crown tooth to cut things like plastic. Now they'll, they'll tell you that PGT and mock will cut it. Lastly, there is a hook tooth blade. They've got a, we've got something almost as thick as a coping saw blade that you can put in a scroll saw. And it is hooked like a band saw tooth. And it is set. Set means that they take each, when the teeth are not set, all the teeth line up straight. When they're set, as on a hand saw, or almost any other blade, or a band saw, or even a, a blade that goes into a table saw, they're, they're cocked in opposite directions, and it allows for a more aggressive. And yes, I have cut a two by four, eight feet long. I needed a notch, and I didn't like that skill saw. So I got Catherine, Catherine hold the end of that two by four for me. And we cut it on a scroll saw. Okay, so what I want to do now is we'll talk a little bit about this and then I'll just do a quick little cut about what scroll saws. I have used, my original was a rigid. I sold it, purchased an RBI. You guys ever heard of RBI Hawk? 
$1,200 scroll saw. But the man at the fair showed me there was no mistake. I didn't have to know that sound and what it got tensed to because it's got this little dial back there. You just dial it right up to the appropriate tension. And after I've learned the sound, I realize I like it just a skosh more than what they indicate on there. My RBI is a good old mule. She's American made. All aluminum, I guess, cast iron. I'm not sure what all the parts are. And I can see every part on it is exposed. Only got 10 spots that needs to be oiled. That saw has never failed me, not one time sitting down to it. Um, it is a parallel arm, meaning that 80% of scroll saws out there today use the parallel arm method. It has three pieces to it. Two arms here and a piece in the middle holding them together. Okay, um, So that as it moves up and down, the blade cuts straight. However, the folks who make Excalibur, they're out of, they, they were out of Canada, um, Somerville Design was the name of the company and it used to be purple. They developed what DeWalt now uses because when DeWalt wanted to, they developed a new method for cutting and it's actually a bit more complicated. With a parallel arm, if you get a 16 inch delta parallel arm, not a lot of vibration to it. I have a 26 inch RBI. That's how, that's the distance of the throat from the blade to how much clearance that you have here. So mine goes another six inches beyond this uh, DeWalt. Now you get a lot of vibration because you have a lot of up and down movement here. Somerville Design realized that they could change the orientation of movement and reduce the vibration. And I bought that RBI one month before I went off to my Intarja class where at Robert's studio they use Excaliburs. And why? Because Jerry's a tool man and he tried them all and that was, by golly, the best, least vibration of all of them. And he was right. But I didn't sell my RBI. I kept it. I just bought another one. So, when DeWalt came out with theirs, they had gone to the folks at Excalibur and they, called, they, they asked them, they had heard theirs was the least vibration. It's called a double parallel link system. In essence, the up and down movement is what gives vibration to the saw. Only the last several inches of this saw has up and down movement. What they're using is a horizontal movement in here, in these parts of it. It makes for a more complicated mechanism, right, but less vibration. Uh, and I tell everybody that if I had my De DeWalt, I purchased as, as, a third, as my third purchase, it was a second saw in the shop because my RBI was not very portable, I needed a portable saw. My DeWalt became my portable saw and it was very quickly my favorite saw over the RBI, unless I had to cut a lot of stuff up out all at one time. I can just go more aggressively on the RBI. Um, I tell everybody, had I, only, had I purchased this saw first, I probably never would have purchased another saw. That may be a lie, but... Okay, so, I, mine's tricked out just a tiny bit. I've got a light here, it's because it came with a saw, and I normally have a magnifier lamp that I always use here because you cannot see, by the time you see here that you're off the line, you've been off the line for an eighth of an inch. So with a magnifier, when I get down to doing intarsia, by that point, I need to be pretty doggone accurate. And that's the only way that I can tell is when I'm really looking through a magnifying glass. What I found out, though, was I, I do my magnifier from this side and this light from this side and eliminates cross, eliminates shadow by giving me cross lighting. The other thing that I have on here for this DeWalt, the DeWalts are not tuned so that you can just raise the arm and it stay up like this. It wants to flop down. If you buy an Excalibur, General now sells Excalibur, they're green instead of purple, that arm stays up by itself. The poor man's method, which I have, right? Poor man's method is like that. And the ones that work, I, I, I drill a hole, put a string so that they don't, they aren't lost, right? They just, they just bubble off right here. They, that goes right here. The rich man's method, not really, it's the tool addict's method, is this piece so, sold by Jim Dandy, it's called an easy lift system, it's so smart, it's like a paper clip, you wonder why they didn't do it, everybody does it, it's just a spring that's giving me tension here, so I added this on, and we actually have some of these at, at work if you guys are interested. The other thing that I do is I put a foot pedal on my saw, 
Um, and I have mine rigged up so that it turns the back and the saw, when I press it, it turns the saw on, which in turn turns the back on. I will tell you, because uh, Paul said, because I wasn't going to bring my saw, because I didn't think we could do anything in here. He says, yeah, but that doesn't make a lot of sawdust. Well, it's not a router and it's not a jointer or a planer, but it makes the worst sawdust for breathing. So when I'm doing intarsia and scrolling for an entire day, I'll wear a mask. But I tell everybody, you need to add dust collection. Now, if you own a Delta, little, those little bench top models, and I, I don't know about Ryobi's, they're a little plastic model, but I know Dremel has one. Often they have dust collection built right in. My RBI had a little had a little hole. I owned that one for uh, two years before I realized that that was a spot for me to put a hose into. This is an add-on product here, and we have something at Woodcraft that looks a little bit differently. And I have I've gone through three different varieties here, but it's just a way that I've mounted it to my saw, and so that I can use dust collection. Okay. And the other thing is, is to put it on a very solid, uh, put it on a solid stand. Excalibur makes a great sand stand. We sell both the Dewalt and the Excalibur at uh, Woodcraft. I tell everybody, I'm going to have to sell one of these saws. The problem is, my Dewalt I can take it to Fesler's Lane. I can take it somewhere in Atlanta, somewhere in Oregon, and I can get it fixed. Right? My Excalibur is a little trickier. Whereas my DeWalt, the table tilts when I want to make those angular cuts, and this is what make, one of the things that makes it so great about the Excalibur, is the arm tilts. The table stays flat. So if you're doing collapsible baskets, which are scrolling at about 5 or 10 degrees, that is enough gravity to make you have to fight to keep it on the line. So Working flat can be a, an awesome thing. I have one segmented turner. He's using his Excalibur to cut 45s. We had to actually enlarge the hole so I could do a 45 degree cut. Absolutely, if you're doing 45 degree cut, can you imagine trying to do that like this at a 45? That'd be very difficult. The other neat thing that I like about the Excalibur's table that, that stays still is that you know it's got a detent where 90 degrees or zero degrees is at. For the DeWalt, I have to use a protractor and my fine tool, tool adjustment here. There we go. To get it back at 90. Delta's little 16 inch. It only tilts in one direction. Not a bad thing because they have a little screw over here. Boom. You go back. If you've adjusted and calibrated it right, it's for back at zero degrees, so it's not a bad thing. It, and tilting it one direction is not going to inhibit you from being able to do something. Okay, so the last thing is, is we, most everything comes now with some, uh, some blowing some air. So I guess what we'll do is just go ahead and cut this guy a little bit. Anybody have any questions, or can I go ahead and go ahead and do this? giving her first lesson on how to use a scroll saw. I think she had only one lesson on how to use a scroll saw. And they had pictures of her hands here, and they weren't right. She did talk about holding the material close to the blade. The one thing that you throw away, you don't throw it away, is this little presser foot. It looks like a presser foot from a sewing machine. You need to be close to the blade. Will the blade cut you? Sometimes. But it's not bad. Band-Aid, just have a Band-Aid. Um, but with this here, I can't control my work. So I took OSHA required that. So we just get rid of that. And I don't know a scroll sawyer who uses that. <coughs> so when you're working the scroll saw, the very first thing you want to do is line yourself up to the scroll saw. I don't want to be leaning on one foot or the other. If I'm sitting and have my foot pedal up here, I try to stay as straight as I can because my body has a natural gyroscope in it. And I'm going to leverage that. 
I'll keep my fingers closed. I'm driving this back here with my thumb. Can you see it? Table. To make a circle, you put a nail or something in to hold it, right? Mm -hmm. And you spin your material. I can do exactly the same thing with a straw saw. But in this case, it's just going to be me being, it's just going to be me being the pivot point. And this is an exercise that I get people to try and do. I've created some uh, test, some practice patterns that incorporate this. Every line that appears here has actually got a hidden circle in it. Every arc. You can see the big circle out of the Pocapelli here of his back, right? But even the smallest ones here will is part of a circle. So if I'm doing this circle here where I've used my washer, the center of the washer is going to be my pivot point. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get close to it. I'm going to be at the line here. I'm going to put my finger at this pivot point. And I'm going to pretend that I'm actually a nail holding it down. And I'm going to watch and make sure that this pivot point will not move. So, seamstresses, this is one where the chat doesn't matter whether you're seeing you're the machoist guy in here who would be caught dead sewing. This is the key to all of it right here. So these military plaques to everything, a perfect circle is the hardest thing to cut, is to learn to, learn to use this pivot point. I'm about at 90 degrees off of the blade. I'm going to stop this here, and now I'm going to turn I cannot control where the blade cuts. All I can control is what's feeding into the blade. Now, when in the beginning, when you're trying to cut a circle, it's like when you first try to drive a car. You overcorrect left then right. So it's really a series of straight line curve, straight line and curve. in any of my cuts, wherever I begin and wherever I end will be a little bit offset. Even if it's almost perfect, it's a little nib there. And you guys can even see it here. Oh, with the exception of that, that's not a half bad circle.
this young woman who had the pictures, she held her hands flat on the material. You can't play a piano like that flat, right? The trick is if you do it, if it's like my hands, they'll cramp after a while. Keep your fingers loose. So here I am. Here's my cactus. And you, you guys can tell I am not on the line. But I never judge my piece here, especially when I don't have to mate up. I'll look on this side because nobody's going to see that in a minute when I take that off, right? All they're going to see is this cactus. And if I determine, you know, it's got a little bit too much wonk to it, I'll come take it out a little bit. But if I go, that's emergent <coughs> art right there. I'll accept that and go on. All right. I guess that's about it for tonight. It's can I, kind can of I ask you one question? Yeah. Uh, talk about the speed of the blade. Is the speed? Yeah. Uh, I will, let's just show y'all how slow. This is, a, this is a different skin. Let me turn this. Let me turn off this. Uh, this guy for a second. Let's see if we can. Yeah, right here. So you guys can hear the speed. So the speed of the scroll saw can range to very slow and very fast. Scroll saw blades, the thinner the material, the smaller the number, the slower the speed you want to go. The thicker the material, the higher the number blade, the faster you want to go. I get most people to start at around 60 or 70 percent. Anywhere from 50 to 70 percent the speed of the saw. Um, there is a resonant point in every saw. There's only one scroll saw on the market that has zero vibration. It's called an eclipse, and I've worked on it. It's a sweet saw. It's my, I want one of those saws. But it doesn't have any, it, it, it uses a band. It, it doesn't have arms. It rocks a carbon cable back and forth. Jay, I thought you might like that. That was pretty interesting on that leg. I, I was impressed. So what you find out is I can hear it, but I don't think you guys can hear it. Let's see if we can see it. Anybody got a nickel? I don't have a nickel. Yeah. Talking to woodworkers, they wouldn't give it to you if they had That's one. That's right. <laughs> I got washers, but they're too thin. <laughs> Let's see if the nickel test will show it. It's usually about 80% of the saw. That just kind of fell over. It's Right now, it's almost at maximum vibration. It's at a resonant point to the saw, and that's my most vibration. And it's about the, almost 80 to 90 percent of the DeWalt. And the DeWalt and the Excalibur have the least vibration, with the exception of the Eclipse, which has literally zero vibration. Um, so, what do I scroll at? I'll scroll wide open. I don't suggest most people scrolling wide open because I am in control of how fast it's cutting. Right, sewers? You, you go wide open, man, and you're just keeping up with material. But I am in control because I'm the one pushing the wood through. So you actually can go too slow on material very often. You can go too slow more so than you can go too fast the speed of the blade. Okay. Now another thing that I like about having a foot pedal on Something I, should, I don't know whether I should teach y'all this. I do teach it, but Jerry would have a hissy fit if he knew I taught this. You can pump it because in the beginning you get you get anxious. The more you get off the line, the faster you push it, the more you're off the line. So I pump it. The problem with pumping is you're not supposed to. Turn the wood when the saw's not on because it does that. All right? Yes. So there's a little that you have to. 
a little bit you have to figure out for yourself. And I'll tell you guys, I, I, you know, if you haven't had a neurological problem before, or if you're not 50, uh, maybe you guys don't have better days than other days for scrolling. I most definitely scroll better in the morning than in the afternoon, and I scroll, there are some days, there are non-tool days. You know, it doesn't matter. It's a non-tool day, I don't care if the scroll saw. And in fact, I have to be more accurate with this tool than any other tool in my shop. Well, that you use, where do you get it at? Oh, woodcraft. <laughs> 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 However, there are some elves that tell me some of this wood's available elsewhere. I used to get it uh, until I got my own planer. Uh, I got a lot of thin material from Sloan's Wood Shop. Do you, are you all familiar with Sloan's? Callis Road out in Lebanon? Great supply of quarter, you can get quarter inch. I have hundreds of dollars to get started out with, right, of, of various species of wood. And what I found out was um, I really wanted to be able, sometimes I see this board, I'm going, this board's got my name on it, I see it here, but it's not as thin as I wanted. So that's when I got into my own getting a planer. It's more expensive to buy wood already thinned down than it is to buy this to buy it regular nominal size and then take the whatever you need to do. Let me show y'all one, one last thing. We did this. This is a Coca Pelli. And yes, I do learn that sometimes I come up, yes, this is original art, Deborah's, Deborah's Coca Pelli. Uh, and yes, it was a beginner scroll saw class, right? What's the problem with this Coca Pelli for a beginner scroll saw class? It's a perfect circle, right? Nice smooth back. It's hard for beginners to get a nice smooth back like that. So we got tools. We got little sanders. You know, there's all these other little things that we can do to sand this. And we are, there are even sanders that fit inside here and little files when you can sand here and the little hand sanders. So we, we do some things. But the biggest thing is when you're a beginner, I want you guys to just go with the flow. It's a Zen thing. You just accept. You accept the fact that you blew the eyeballs out. And you go on to the next project. Right? But this is a Coca Pelli that I did in one of my classes. And he's flat. I'm going to do some pyrography on it. But I'm going to keep him flat. And then this one, I was doing some um, sanding with. I have all kinds of sanders. I think he even got my Fordham out with some of this. But you can do this with a Dremel. Right? Dremel. I did, I did my very first pieces. This little, this little guy I did with. Did I do Dremel? I think I did a Dremel, but I don't know how I did those leaves. Those leaves were not done with the Dremel. I can't remember how I, did, how I did the leaves. And you notice here, let's just talk about a little bit other equipment here. I know I'm a little bit fancy in some areas and not fancy in others. When I did earrings, the most difficult thing about these earrings were drilling the, this hole where the finding gets, goes in for it to be vertical. And I had a little Dremel and a little press. Still got that Dremel. It's my daughter's when she wants it. Um, except that I still use that as a little tiny router from time to time. Um, but it was not accurate when I pressed it down. This is a Proxon tool. Micromark sells some Chinese knockoffs of this. This is a German-made tool. Uh, you open it up. It's got little pulleys in here. It's made exactly like a big drill press. I could even have a little mil compound milling table on here. It costs buku bucks. So you've got to be at that. Got to be at that point in your life when you can do that. And it's okay with yourself. You're okay with yourself for doing this. I made a little table for it here, but I leave this at, uh, leave this with me. My daughter, she's going to be using my Dremel, and, and if I had no other tools, one reason why I've never gotten rid of my Dremel, I can out that fit that Dremel with just about anything, and there's a lot of things that I can accomplish with it, and that's one reason I've never gotten rid of it. But this is a Proxon tool. I do have a Proxon router table, which I, which I use quite a bit, as a matter of fact. This little detail on here, was done on the Proxon router table. It has a, and it has a hole for dust collection. This is a 25-year-old quarter cable sander. And yes, I own a lot of Festool sanders. Uh, but that's my 25-year-old quarter cable that I put in here. And this was a uh, little jig off of one of the magazines. I saw this recently, not too, too long ago, that they had resurrected that little jig. 
and it works great. And I found out that my DeWalt random orbit, same diameter, fits also inside here. So it's really cool. And I use this for my finished sanding. The only other, the other tools I think that you, if, if all you're going to do is scroll, a little, a little drill press of some kind, and even the next size up, like I had a 10 inch drill press as well, because if you're going to do clock inserts, you need a little bit bigger drill press. But something small to do very tiny holes, uh, a palm sander, and a, one of those tiny little belt sanders, you know, so if you're getting, uh, getting epoxy off. And then you can just deal with getting your wood already, or get a friend to maybe give you some thin wood, and uh, deal with that stuff later on. Well, we really appreciate that program. I want to remind you that this coming month, it will be Mike Bell from the uh, museum, the state museum. They have an excellent furniture